Now, there's a great many pets that you can keep in your aquarium that are going to be super interactive and rush over to the side of the tank the minute you walk into the room. But Axolotl are definitely not one of those pets. And I don't want to lead anybody on and let you think that they are a super interactive, fun to play with pet because that's just not the type of pet they are. They're definitely more of a visual pet, something that you're going to keep to just look at and enjoy. And they are super cute, so they're awesome to look at. But beyond that, they have a pretty incredible backstory, which is unfortunately also super tragic. They're a recent addition to this world. Axolotl evolved only about 10,000 years ago, and we've already pretty much made them extinct in the wild. But at the same time, you can still get them for aquarium, which is kind of crazy. But given that we can get them, should we get them? I have them. I've got loads. I bred them. I've had them in aquariums, and now I've got them in ponds. And I learned a lot about them along the way. So I think we should take a look at where they came from, a bit about their history, and then maybe talk about their care requirements, because where they came from really, really dictates how we keep them. They've got some specific care requirements. They're not necessarily the easiest thing to get set up, but once you get it set up, they're quite easy to keep. So it's just up to you then whether or not you want to. So let's talk a little bit about Axolotl. My name's Greg and you're very welcome to the Joy of Aquascaping where we look at all things fish related. I've worked with fish for over 20 years now, both as a hobbyist and as a professional. And I wanna share all of the things that I've learned with you to help make your fish keeping experience even better. Stay tuned for tank builds, species specific information and all things fish keeping related. Thanks for watching the joy of aquascaping. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Axolotl are a type of salamander, closely related to the tiger salamander and a number of other salamanders around the area that they come from. But Axolotl, unlike the rest of their cousins, don't metamorphosize into that last stage of being a terrestrial amphibian. They never lose their gills and they stay in their juvenile form. But unlike the rest of them, they can still breed in that juvenile form. Basically, they stay tadpoles for life. That's called neoteny. That's where they retain their juvenile form, but reach sexual maturity. So they will start releasing eggs and still looking pretty much the same way they did when they were only a baby tadpole. Tadpoles for life. And that's partly why they're super cute. Those big fluffy gills that they've got, they do look very cute indeed. The reason they never evolved into the next stage is because they didn't have to. There were no predators in the lakes that they evolved in. And outside of the lakes was a pretty hostile environment. They were surrounded by desert. There just wasn't anything out there for them. So they stayed in the lakes, they figured out a way, and they developed into the axolotl that we know today, like I said, about 10,000 years ago. Now, unfortunately for the axolotl, humans arrived a couple of hundred years ago in the area. And they started building cities on the lake that axolotl evolved in. Now, that was fine for the axolotl because they were revered as gods until the Spanish arrived and during their conquests, they just wiped out the axolotl's habitat by draining massive amounts of the land in order to get land fit for humans that they could use for habitation, farming, etc. So the axolotl's habitat came under massive threat. Now, even still, with that threat and that habitat reduction, they were still found in numbers up to about 6,000 per square kilometre up until the late 90s. But unfortunately for the axolotl, by the time we got to 2020, studies were finding them at zero per square kilometre, which made it look like they were potentially extinct in the wild. Now, thankfully, there have been some small numbers spotted in some of the canals around the area, but their future is still very much under threat because not only have we taken most of the area that they lived in and filled it with pollution, we've also unfortunately introduced fish, which not only predate on the axolotl and their young, but also on the food that the axolotl would eat. So efforts to get them reestablished in the wild are currently being met with some well, tricky hurdles that we're going to have to overcome if we're ever going to get the axolotl properly reintroduced into the area from which they evolved. I think we should take a quick step back in time and look at those lakes before they were drained because they had some pretty unique features which have led to the axolotl having some very specific care requirements if we want to keep them in an aquarium today. Now the first particular requirement and the main one for most people, this is the one that catches most people off guard, is that axolotl don't do warm water. These guys like cooler temperatures that can actually be difficult to achieve depending on where you live in a home aquarium. The lakes that they evolved in are just not warm. They're spring-fed lakes. The water comes out of the mountain. They're pretty consistently cool temperature of 16 to 18 degrees. And that's the temperature that your axolotl like. It doesn't even matter that the temperature outside in the area that they come from ranges between 19 and 37 degrees. Your axolotl probably won't like the temperature of the room 
in your house, even here in Ireland, where temperatures never get too warm, ever, it still gets too warm to keep an axe model aquarium in just the coolest room in my house. Because if the temperatures get to 22 to 24 degrees for any extended period of time, your axe model gets super uncomfortable and they may die. And that is, it's a tricky one to do. It's very difficult to keep an aquarium all year round at only 16 to 18 degrees. So for an awful lot of people, that immediately renders them an unsuitable pet. If you live somewhere where it gets very warm, you're just not going to be able to keep these guys. And that's it, because they won't survive. But there are some tricks that we can use to actually get the aquarium temperatures down. Places like Ireland, where, like I said, it does get too warm for them in aquariums. I can use a simple, cheap hack that works super effectively and gets the temperature of the aquarium down by a couple of degrees. That's just by putting a fan blowing air across the top of the aquarium. Now, there are a couple of aquarium-specific ones that are designed to put, be put onto the side of the tank and blow air across the surface, and that just increases evaporation, which results in a temperature drop of up to a couple of degrees. And for me, that's always been absolutely enough, because like I said, Ireland doesn't get too warm. But if you live somewhere where the weather is just better, that might not be enough. Now, if you get free heat waves, what a lot of people do is they'll put bottles of water into the freezer they let them freeze and then you can just take them, put them into the aquarium. And as they melt and that they heat up, well, they're going to draw some of the heat out of the water in the aquarium and cool the overall temperature down pretty gradually. And you can just keep on getting those bottles, putting them back into the freezer, switching them around. But it's a super manual process and just not something that's sustainable in the long run for most people. You're just not going to manage that. The next option that you have, and it's just really kind of the only one you've got, if you love somewhere where it gets really warm, is to go for a chiller unit. And chiller units are already a pre-existent solution in the hobby. They're basically like a refrigerator that you pump the water from your aquarium through. And when it comes back out the far side, it's nice and cool going back into the aquarium. They've been around for a long time because people who keep reefs quite often need to keep their corals at like super specific temperatures. And they work super effectively. You can turn it on at a particular temperature and have it set up so that it'll go off once it reaches the right temperature. But they can be tricky to use with Axolotl because quite often they don't go as low as you need them to. That 16 to 18 degrees just isn't the range of them all. So keeping Axolotl is going to be tricky. And then even if you are using fans and you're using chillers and you're maintaining all that, you've got to be sure that your power grid is super stable. Because if it's not and that, that electricity goes, there goes your cooling facilities. And unfortunately, your axolotl probably won't last very long if the temperatures start creeping right up there. So that can render them just absolutely not a suitable pet for a lot of people straight out the gate. Now, another limiting factor for people can just be how big axolotl will get because you might get it as a tiny baby. It's going to be super cute. It's going to be about that size. Very quickly, though, those guys get big. I mean, they can get up to 18 inches. That's kind of in the wild and you're never going to see one in the wild. So you're never probably going to see one 18 inches. But... My guys are at 9 to 12 inches. They get a foot long, and you probably won't see that too much in aquariums. You'll usually probably see them 8, 9 inches, and I personally have never seen one bigger than 7 or 8 inches in a pet store. And at that size, wow, these guys get expensive. But they do a lot of walking around, and, and they don't swim up and down as much. So you're going to need a big aquarium with a large footprint. And, I mean, a 40-gallon aquarium is suitable for these guys. If you're going to keep one or maybe two, 40 gallons is going to get you there. If you have plenty of hides in them and lots of plants to break up line of sight. But it's going to need to be wider and longer than it is deeper. So it's going to take up a lot of space. And you can do a lot with a 40 gallon with a big wide base. And you can do tons with a 40 gallon. And have a super interactive tank with a crazy aquascape. And all of a sudden you got to ask yourself again. By the time I've set up an expensive chiller unit perhaps. And I'm cooling this thing down. And it's a massive aquarium. Is Axolotl for me? I don't know. I don't know. Is it for you? It's definitely for me still. I am still all over Axolotl at this stage. But for an awful lot of people, they're out the door now at this point. They're not interested in the Axolotl anymore. And I understand. I get that. But if you're still here, you're probably still thinking about the Axolotl like me. So let's keep going and talk about a couple more of care requirements. Because if you're going to set up an Axolotl aquarium, it's not only going to be big. There's a couple of other things that you're going to have to do besides making it cold. If you want to keep these guys and keep them healthy and happy because... Yeah, they're, they're tricky sometimes. And that's mainly because of the way that they hunt and eat. They are carnivores and they'd go around and they'd be sucking up any worms or insects or crustaceans or even tiny fish. 
that were in the lakes that they evolved in, and they had no predators, and they just wander around, sucking in anything that went past and consuming it. And that's how axolotl eat in the wild. And in the aquarium, we're going to feed them things like worms. Earthworms are a fantastic way to feed them because you can gut load them with lots of good nutrients. Things like live blackworms or frozen blackworms. And you can give them treats like bloodworms. And you can get very specific axolotl pellets that are designed for carnivores, like a whole diet. So axolotl can be a little bit tricky on them, but I find most of them will come around to them eventually, as long as they're like anyway decent. But they will consume anything that's in front of them by creating this massive suction, just a vacuum, and sucking in whatever's in front of them. And if the wrong thing is in front of them and they ingest that, that can get stuck inside them and cause a thing called impaction. If you ever see axolotl on a gravel substrate, so gravel all over the bottom, just know their bellies are probably full of stones and it's going to cause them issues in the long run. You should never, ever pick up axolotl from a breeder or from a pet store where they keep them on gravel because you're probably going to be facing vet bills at the very minimum or axolotl that don't last very long because if they can't pass those stones, it's going to prevent them from eating, prevent them from absorbing nutrients. They'll become nutrient deficient. They won't last very long. They might get uncomfortable. They might injure themselves. Very specifically, cannot have stuff in the aquarium that can get caught inside their bodies. Now, there's an easy way around that. You know, either have the items in the aquarium at least two times the size of their head, and that way they definitely can't swallow them, or have them so fine that they'll pass through their body. And if you're going to put stuff into the aquarium like rocks and, and sand, you just need to be mindful of that. Personally, I like sand on the bottom of the aquarium because it gives their little feet something to grip on and something for them to hunt around in. It creates a nice surface area for good bacteria to grow on. It means that they're not kind of floating around and just kind of getting moved in any bit of current because Axel don't like current. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But it gives them some traction, you know, some to grip on. And they will appreciate it. I find my guys do. And you'll find little footprints everywhere all over the aquarium, like I said, the next morning. It is super cute just even to look at. But I do find sand is quite good if it's a fine pool sand or a fine play sand, a non-toxic one for kids. If they consume it, it'll pass straight through them. So that completely just rules out the issue of getting an impaction. They'll be absolutely fine. And most of the time, they'll spit most of it back out. But if they do consume some, it's not at the end of the world at all. It'll just pass straight through them. And if you're going to put rocks and stones and pebbles in, just make sure that they're soft, they've got rounded edges, no sharp edges. They'll damage those gills and their body is a very thin membrane. You need to look after them and not have sharp things in. Just don't put anything sharp in the aquarium at all. They will injure themselves. Just make sure they're at least twice the size of their head and they definitely won't be able to ingest it. So you're going to avoid the risk of impaction completely if you do that. So that's just an easy way of getting around all those nightmare issues. Wait, there. <laughs> There's more, unfortunately, because axolotl stopped at a stage of evolution where they haven't yet developed like working functional eyelids. They don't have any way of getting away from the light. If you stick a bright light in their eyes, they will find it awfully uncomfortable. The area that they evolved in, it's cloudy from early June to late October. Very, very much. So that's cloudy season. And the rest of the year, it's kind of cloudy quite a bit as well. So... That's something that they're fine with, but they're kind of swampy areas, so there was lots of vegetation. They have plenty of places to hide out of the light, so you're going to need to give them a bunch of hides. And I find quite often long plants are a great way of just making sure that they've got the cover they need. And also floating plants as well. I use in particular duckweed and I use Elodia densa. Water spiders are a great one. Not only do they give them places to kind of chill out and relax away from any bright lights, and it means you can make a nice aquascape. You can put a light over the aquarium still and, and just enjoy the look of it but without the light being straight in their eyeballs you know that's good for them if you can give them that bit of shade it'll make them more comfortable generally if they've got places that they can hide if they know they can retreat somewhere you'll probably see them a little bit more often you pretty much always see the little head poking out or a little tail poking out and it is super cute just watching them chill out and relax in there the other thing it'll do is particularly if you've got more than one create kind of blocks in the line of sight they won't be able to see other acts lot all over the aquarium it depend on where they are, they'll, they'll not be seeing each other all the time. And then they won't be bothering each other because I find like in the pond, I've got maybe 16 axolotl in there. They're fine. They never interfere with each other. They might actually pile on top of each other and chill out. And then sometimes they want to be by themselves, but they've got enough space to be able to just go away from each other and not be bothered by each other. But in in an aquarium, if they're just forced like right beside each other all the time, 
they can start competing for resources and stuff like that. So you do need to be mindful of that. That's that's important. Give them places that they can hide, places they can chill out. And females can just climb in the plants and release their eggs in them if they're breeding because, you know, axe are actually super easy to breed. It's kind of one of the pros of them is that compared to most other salamander, which can be super tricky, they once they reach that terrestrial stage, there's certain triggering factors, climate factors, all this kind of thing that you need to make sure you've got right in order from the breed. Axe Neotony, they just breed in the water. If they're comfortable, they're happy, and they've got all the things that they need. They've got enough space, and they've got enough food. They'll be absolutely fine. But you do need to give them places where they'll feel comfortable and make them just feel, you know, stress-free. Otherwise, that's not going to happen. So lots of plants, it makes a nice aquascape, and it just gives them lots of nice hiding places too, which is really important for your axolotl. Now, the next thing I think we should talk about is wood, because an awful lot of people will try add more and more to try and make it into a super interactive tank. And um, or at least something that's super aesthetically pleasing. Wood can be kind of dangerous, particularly if there's anything sharp on it, like any branches, things like mapani wood and stuff out the window, straight away, forget about it, don't use it. Because axolotl, they can get a bit of a fright, they can get startled. And if they hear a big bump or there's a bang or a knock on the floor or something drops, or you turn on a light or any of those kind of simple things, your axolotl can turn and fly across the far side of the aquarium. And turn on a penny and it'll be gone super speed they move fast when they want to and they can impale themselves on things you need to be super careful that there's nothing sharp in there that they can damage themselves on plus on top of that those gills are super fragile and their skin is a very thin membrane and you should not touch their skin don't do it it's just not cool for axolotl for you to be handling them unless it's absolutely necessary it's going to stress them out they'll never get super comfortable with it so just don't handle your axolotl that's another reason why people might not really find them super interactive. There's plenty of pets you can put in a 40 gallon aquarium that will be interactive, but axolotl, that's that's not them. But during feeding time, you can absolutely interact with them. And if you're going to feed them things like live worms and earthworms and stuff like that, you can use tweezers and you can, it's, it's a bit more interactive. It can be a bit fun just watching them eat and being involved in that process. So there are ways that you can do a little bit of interacting with them. But definitely when you're setting up the aquarium, you're going to want to make sure you've got it cool. You've got it big enough. You have the right substrate. There's nothing in there that they can get impaction with. So nothing that's going to fit in their mouth, but not pass through them. There's nothing sharp. And then on top of that, their filtration system is going to have to be kind of a particular setup because that lake that they come from or the two lakes that they came from, almost now flowing it. So that means your standard filtration system kind of just doesn't really work for these guys. I mean, it will handle their waste. It's got to... It's just going to make them super uncomfortable. Because in an aquarium, you're usually going for a turnover of the volume of water in the aquarium through the filter between three and five times an hour. And what that facilitates is getting each molecule of water that contains ammonia or nitrites or nitrates through the filter past your good bacteria and sorted within the hour. So that's usually the way we want to set up a tank. That's way too much flow for an axolotl. They won't like that at all. So I find instead of having like a big mechanical filter and a pump and stuff like that, simple sponge filters work best. No, it's not going to do much by way of mechanical filtration. There are ways we can handle axolotl poop because they leave little packets. You can spot clean it. Genuinely, I think that the best way to set up their aquarium in terms of filtration is to give them really good biological filtration. Aquariums that have low flow rates like your axolotl aquarium tend to go super nasty in those lower levels of the water because... They're not getting up to the surface for gas exchange to occur, and they can get super toxic down there, like really, really nasty. And unfortunately, that's where your axolotl are going to spend most of their time. Putting in a couple of sponge filters, it will suck the water from the bottom of the aquarium in through the sponge, allowing for biological filtration. And then with the bubbles, it'll rise up to the surface, allowing for gas transfer to take place, and just create kind of pockets of circulation in the aquarium. And your axolotl will climb up on top of them. And have a bit of fun and they'll be bouncing around the place. But they won't do that for very long. They'll want to get back into that low flow area pretty quickly once they're just not in the humor for playing in the bubbles anymore. But it is kind of a, a nice fun way to watch them and kind of having a bit of crack in the aquarium. And it is entertaining to watch. But that does still leave poop in the aquarium because air sponge filters don't deal with mechanical filtration, which is the process of trapping the waste themselves. Like I said, axolotl, they tend to do kind of big poop packets but they also walk around and they mash them into the floor of the aquarium, which can get a little bit gross. So it is important that you do get them out as quickly as possible. And personally, 
I prefer to just spend two minutes a day just going spot, 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 and doing a quick siphon, clearing that out in an aquarium, and just not having the waste in there to cause trouble, than leaving it in, a, you know, in a big mechanical filtration setup that, setup that they don't enjoy because of the currents, where the waste is still breaking down and being turned into nitrites and nitrates. If you get that poop out of there quickly, it's gone, and you can use a turkey baster, and that'll work just fine. And that means that you can leave your water changes to once a week and do a, a smaller volume, and you can get your maintenance down to about a half an hour a week. And, you know, that's still too much for some people, but I would say if you can't give your pet, whether it be a goldfish or an axolotl or anything else you keep in the aquarium, if you can't give them half an hour maintenance a week, best to avoid keeping them because you won't have the time to deal with the maintenance that they do require because I can't think of an aquarium that requires less than half an hour a week that a beginner could possibly get set up in. Particularly at the start, there's going to be a little bit of work to do. You're going to need to get everything balanced and established and it can just take a while. So, you know, I think, yeah, axolotl for me, I think I, I, I love them. I don't never want to have axolotl because they're great. But are they for everybody? Probably not. Now let's talk a little bit about their regenerative capabilities because they're second to none in the animal kingdom. There's no vertebrates that can do anything like what axolotl do. We talked a little bit about them being in the otney where they're staying in that kind of larval stage and not fully metamorphosizing into their adult amphibious form. But that actually has just some super benefits for them because in that stage, if they get a wound, that will be covered in cells that can be reprogrammed by the axolotl's DNA to turn into whatever was there in the first place. So they'll regrow their gills, limbs, their, their eyes, brain, heart. They can regrow all sorts of body parts that are just... Com if we had an injury like what axolotl can have, it would be completely catastrophic. We would not survive. But axolotl, they can shrug it off over the course of a couple of weeks or months. So scientists are super interested in their regenerative capabilities. We shouldn't be putting that to the test in home aquariums, though. And that's why you're going to want to give them the right setup and not keep them with fish, not get them too warm, not put sharp things in there. And give them, you know, stuff in there that they can't swallow and consume and get stuck in their body. So, yeah, they have some very specific care requirements, but they're a super interesting pet. We have almost made them extinct in the wild and their future is uncertain. They have started reestablishing them in a quarry that's been rejuvenated it's been turned into a habitat not too far from the original site where axolotl did evolve. It's not their original habitat. It's not the swamps they evolved in. But it's a really interesting project. And I'm really hoping that it is the first successful rewilding attempt for these guys. Because it will be so sad to see such an amazing creature lost in the wild so shortly after it even evolved. Humans just need to do better. Just look after axolotl. And if you want to keep them... They're out there. They breed easily and they, they are something that you can, you know, grow and develop and create different color morphs and stuff like that. You shouldn't always breed axolotl, though. I do want to mention that, like, if you get two of them that look the same from the same aquarium at the same time, they're probably siblings and you definitely shouldn't breed those because axolotl's genetic diversity has been massively negatively affected by the fact that their wild population has decreased so significantly. Breeding populations in labs and in aquariums and homes, fortunately, just haven't got the same level of genetic diversity. And it's really important for the axolotl to maintain that in order for them to maintain the traits that they have and just to stay being axolotl. So if you're going to breed them, be super careful about it. Something I don't recommend doing until you've really established yourself in the hobby. Just because they can doesn't mean we should. I think that's really important as well. Guys, that's it. You make the decision. Let me know if you're getting axolotl, if you've got axolotl, how your experiences are with them. I keep mine in a pond. They do amazing out there. I've got a bunch of videos. You can check them out. And, you know, they absolutely love it. They get big. They eat loads. They're just, they're awesome. I absolutely love them. They are absolutely for me. Let me know if they're for you in the comments. And we'll talk to you in the next video. Take care.